Rose Lerner. Um, I'm a historical romance author as well as a freelance editor and research assistant. Um, I'll be reading, and can you all hear me? Because I'm I'm still seeing Sam as the speaker, so I just okay, great. Um, so I'm a historical romance author as well as a freelance editor and research assistant. Um, I'll be reading from my new Audible original, uh, which is a queer Jewish Regency Gothic. Um, so the easiest way to explain it. I mean, I'm so sorry to pause you, but can you all see me or are you still seeing Sam? Okay, I'm gonna assume it's all good. Um, so the easiest way to explain it is that it's a Jane Eyre retelling in which the governess falls for the wife in the attic. So uh, you can listen if you wanna listen. Um, it's an audiobook. it's at audible.com slash wife. Um, and look, I like reading aloud, but like, I think that you'll see why they hired a professional uh, before the audiobook because uh, my narrator is very, very good um, and also can do a British accent, which I can't. Uh, so I will also be reading in my normal voice um, like Kat. Um, and I decided to start from the beginning so that there wouldn't be a bunch of context to explain. Um, if you've read my Lively St. Lemiston series, you might spot a few familiar faces, but this book does stand alone. Um, I will probably talk quickly as I start, but like be patient, it'll, it'll chill out. Um, So chapter one, April 16th, 1813, Good Friday, Lively St. Lemiston, West Sussex. Already I couldn't get any air. I knew it would be better to breathe in the smoke and suffocate before the fire reached my toes, but I couldn't. I lacked the strength even to turn my head away as heat kissed my face and the flames licked closer, closer. I bolted upright, drenched in sweat, my heart pounding and the sheets tangled around my legs. I checked the bedside table and the hearth, but no candle burned, no coal smoldered. Only a few rays of pale moonlight lit my drab little room. No shade of red or yellow intruded. It was barely three o'clock with no chance of breakfast until half past eight, but I knew from long experience that I wouldn't sleep again. I would be bone tired all day and it served me right for putting the extra blanket on the bed. I knew better, but I'd been so sick of shivering through the night, feeling the cold seep through my skin to the core of me. It was too early to practice my guitar without waking Mrs. Humphrey's other boarders, and any other employment would require light. I couldn't bring myself to use my tinderbox. A candle would be all right once it was lit, a small, friendly flame safely housed in Papa's old mica sea lantern, but striking the uncontrolled sparks. In an hour, I promised myself. In an hour, I would forget the nightmare, light the damn candle, and read the miseries of an heiress. It would be a relief to immerse myself in miseries so entirely removed from mine. My own father, though his pension had supported us while he lived, had left me barely enough to pay for his funeral and a few new words on my mother's old stone. I never lit the candle. I had bought foul smelling lard candles that week anyway, not having the extra penny for the tallow we had always used at home. I lay in my bed watching dawn creep across the warped boards in the ceiling. And at a quarter past eight, dressed in a hurry and went down to the dining room. I could immediately smell that the porridge was burned. Breakfast at Mrs. Humphreys had never been plentiful or well seasoned, but these last few months were a new nadir. We'd lost our maid of all work, Suki, just before Christmas, and I missed her heartily. Since then, we'd been through six servants, and I felt certain the newest one would burn the house to the ground one fine day. Of course, Mrs. Humphrey didn't mind. When the porridge was scorched, we ate less of it. If a Janiya lemon pushed her spice box towards me, I took as much of her salt as conscience would allow, and together we choked the oatmeal down. Some days this ritual amused me. Today, I saw a thousand such mornings stretched out ahead of me, thin, gray, and unappetizing. The maid of all work in question brought in a folded note. Beside me, Miss Starling's fingers tightened on her spoon as though she might leap up from the table and stab the girl with it. The note was held out to me. What answer shall I give Lady Tassel's footman, ma'am? He's waiting. I was so surprised I did not at once take it. 
Miss Starling set down her spoon to snatch and open the paper, for it was unsealed. Iphigenia, reaching across my place at the table, read it next. Ooh, lucky! She passed it to me. In a hastily elegant scrawl, it read, Miss Oliver, I shall be at the Lost Bell all morning. If you will be so good as to attend me there, I hope to be the means of doing you a service. Yours very sincerely, etc., Diana Tassel. What do you think the service is? Miss Starling asked, eyes bright. Maybe she has a husband for you, if he suggested. Why not? She tried it with Phoebe Diamond. She must know of a child in town who wants to learn the guitar, I said tiredly. Too out of sorts this morning to enjoy the game. Smiles fading, my friend shrugged and turned back to their burnt breakfasts. A hollowness in my chest joined the hollowness in my stomach. The Earl and Countess of Tassel were the Whig patrons of Lively St. Lemiston. Here during Parliament's brief Easter recess to glad hand, scatter largesse, and celebrate Holy Week. Even in their absence, which encompass, encompassed much of the year, their agent in the borough was kept very busy paying for funerals and finding apprenticeships for supporters of the local Whig party. Maybe her ladyship will have a collation laid out, Iphigenia said dreamily. My spoon hovered over my bowl. Bad porridge was sure, a collation a faint hope. Do you think she'll be in a generous mood? Last autumn's election was expensive and a failure. Her eyes crinkled. She's probably throwing good money after bad. People do. I laughed. Iphigenia had always been an optimist after her own cynical fashion. I wasn't. But if I was offered breakfast at the Lost Bell and was too full of oats to eat it, I would kick myself all week. I pushed back my bowl. Poor Iphigenia pulled it towards herself. It wouldn't do to keep her ladyship waiting, I said. Please tell her footman I'll come straight away. Despite the early hour, the sidewalks and streets were thronged. Lent was the Sussex marble season, and today's noon church bells would stop it short. Holding my skirts out of the mud, I wore every petticoat I owned against the cold, and washing day was days away. I skirted chalked circles ringed with men and boys, competing with raucous good cheer in the occasional heated dispute. Meanwhile, the local women skipped rope. A whole group on one long line swung by two people. They chanted and sang and laughed, cheeks rosy and eyes bright in the damp morning. I passed Lord Tassel and some of the other borough patrons joining in the marbles, heedless of muddy knees. But no ladies of equal rank joined the skipping, as they had when I was a girl. Lydia Cahill merely watched her husband's game, arms swallowed by her enormous muff. She would not even blow on his taw for luck until she had demurred for long moments, blushing. It seemed that spring grew chillier and the town's ladies more decorous with each year that went by. I glanced down to be sure I was not lifting my petticoats too far out of the mud and showing too much ankle. At last I reached the lost bell. With so many people out of doors, I had expected to find the coaching, the coaching inn empty but petitioners of every age and sex loitered in the corridor outside the Countess's private parlor. Some bored, some eager, and some desperate. I hoped I was not one of the latter. Yes, I was undeniably shabby genteel in my faded police and yellowing gloves. Yes, the soles of my boots were cracking. Yes, guitar pupils were in short supply. But I had paid my rent on Lady Day. Barely a scrupulous voice inside me amended. If I lost two pupils more, I might not manage it at midsummer. And Mrs. Humphrey accepted nothing but cash on hand. I pushed the thought away and stood straighter, hoping no one heard my stomach rumble at the sound of food, or the smell of food wafting from the tap room. At last a woman with ink-stained fingers asked me my business with Lady Tassel, checked my note against her memorandum book and ushered me into the august present. Quickly averting my gaze from the groaning sideboard, I sank into the deep curtsy due a countess. Clinging to gentility by your fingernails, the voice said, scornful now. At boarding school, we had been led to imagine adorning ballrooms with our accomplishments, not trading on them in rented offices. Alas, it developed that balancing a book on one's head was a profitable talent for a trained bear, 
not a woman. Lady Tassel smiled, gesturing at the food. Please help yourself. Magic words. Probably she had seen my eyes fly greedily to the spread, but shame could not overshadow my pleasure. I filled my plate with hot buttered toast, smoked herring, marmalade. The ham is particularly fine, she said. I pretended I hadn't heard, cutting myself two generous slices of hard local cheese and hurrying to take the hard chair placed opposite Lady Tassel's writing table. Balancing my plate awkwardly on my knees, I bit into my toast with exquisite joy. When had I last eaten white bread? Lady Tassel poured a cup of chocolate through a pot at her elbow. I did not dare hope. I did not dare look at the cup. She slid it towards me. My fingers shook with eagerness as I picked it up. I hoped she thought it was nerves. Oh, bittersweet chocolate and rich cream caressed my tongue whispering of lemon, cinnamon, and cloves. It lingered in my throat, like Romeo and Juliet's bed. I inhaled the steam, despising Mrs. Humphrey's weak tea with all my heart. You have a lovely smile, Lady Tassel said. I wiped it from my face at once. Did the Countess know that was the secret hope of every plain woman? That some Midas touch in her smile would transform her narrow face? long nose and limp, mousy hair. No change of expression could render me lovely. When I was solemn, my lips were too full for English fashion and my smile bared horsey Oliver teeth. I was grateful enough for a new pupil without flattery, but it would be unladylike to say so. Thank you, my lady, you are very kind. You grew up in Portsmouth, didn't you? Are you fond of the sea? Yes, my lady, I said, wondering at the question. We came here when I was 13, after my mother died. I rarely thought of the sea these days, but as a girl, I had loved to walk along the harbor in good and ill weather, watching the men at work in the boats. My mother and I had shared a passion for combing the beach for shards of glass and pottery, worn smooth by the terrible endless friction of the waves. There was nothing so vast in lively St. Leniston. Low green hills bounded the horizon close on every side, and the river Arran barely deserved the title. Yet I knew lively St. Lemiston would wear me smooth and small enough in its time. Tassel Hall is only six or seven miles from the coast, but it's too far to smell the sea, Lady Tassel remarked. At our lodge in Rye Bay, you can see the cliffs from the front windows. I made a polite noise and took another sip of chocolate. One of my Rye Bay neighbors wants a governess for his little girl. I could think of no one else qualified for the role who might be brave enough to travel so far from home. You have always struck me as a self-reliant young woman. This was flattery too, more dangerous than the first. If Lady Tassel truly thought me pretty, she would never recommend me for a governess. If a Janaya, more scholarly and accomplished, had been refused half a dozen such posts over the years, precisely for her incandescent beauty. But self-reliant? I could almost believe that of myself. I crunched my toast smugly between my big Oliver teeth. I should have been wary. I should have known better than to think a little independence of spirit could arm me against all the danger of the wide world. But I was seduced by salt and sugar, chocolate and white flour. The pay is 25 guineas per annum with room and board. I am told the child is obedient enough, although she struck me as a little peculiar. The Countess chuckled. But what child isn't peculiar? I smiled back, mentally turning over that room and board. A governess wasn't family, but she wasn't a servant either. Surely the food would be good and the bed soft. A salary to be received on quarter day instead of rent to pay. Is her mother dead? A shadow passed over Lady Tassel's face. No, but very ill. She does not much leave her room. My heart went out to that obedient, peculiar little girl. An image formed in my mind, a solemn, dark-eyed child, perhaps a little resentful of her lot, inclined to throw stones at birds and make up secret languages. How old is she? Five. Young for a governess, surely. 
Her eyes searched my face. She tapped her pen against the desk, then set it down decisively. Allow me to be blunt. Lady Palethorpe is foreign. Sir Kit wishes his daughter to have a good, genteel English education. She screwed up her mouth. If you will forgive me for offering you a very awkward piece of advice, it might be better not to speak of your mother to him. That's what I got. <laughs>